on it before I begin. Just acknowledge that, that Nick has entrusted to me uh, uh, an hour's worth of your precious time today, I and mean, it is my job to try my very best to make it time well spent. So that's what I'm going to try and do uh, for the next uh, hour or so uh, of our time together. Um, I, I am a philosopher, I'm also a Christian, uh, and I'm beginning, that's the reason why I'm here today, is that I'm beginning a, a research project, a four-year Australian government-funded research project at the moment on the idea of the social contract, uh, what it means, uh, how to renew it, that sort of thing. I guess one of the least controversial things that I could stand up here and say today uh, is that we are living in extraordinary times. Um, the pandemic has caused what's been called an unfrozen moment in our cultural history, uh, where radical social change seems just that little bit more possible than it usually does. In the last 12 months, people have been queuing up to demand a renewal of the social contract. Uh, we've had no lesser figures than the UN Secretary General, uh, Joe Biden, the World Economic Forum, uh, Black Lives Matter activists, and Extinction Rebellion. Uh, and social contract language has been conspicuous uh, in both our own Prime Minister Scott Morrison's discourse and uh, leader of the opposition, Anthony Albanese's language over the past year or so. Uh, they've both drawn on that motif. Uh, Wayne Swan uh, is going big on the idea of the social contract at the moment, and Liberal MP Tim Wilson uh, last year published a book called uh, The New Social Contract, subtitled Renewing the Liberal Vision for Australia. And I don't know if you've noticed, but there have been a series of attempts to brand social contract language as well. Uh, we've got the Green New Deal, haven't we? Build Back Better and the Great Reset. But all variations on this theme of renewing the social country. But it's not just the elites talking to each other either. Uh, if you uh, have a look at, at Twitter, uh, the number of times that new social contract is mentioned doubled between 2018 and 2019, and then doubled again between 2019 and 2020. So given then that the social contract seems to be something that we're all talking about, at the moment. It's important, isn't it, to, to be clear about what we mean by it and what we want when we're asking for it to be renewed. I guess in a gathering like this, it's important to, to think about the, the specific role that Christian institutions might have to play uh, in such a renewal. Philosophically speaking, there are different ways that you can come at this idea of the social contract. The one that I want to pick today uh, is, is through the lens of the common good. So the idea is um, that my good and your good are both better served if we come together in society than if we try and live life separately in the woods and fend for ourselves. Uh, that, that there is something that we both gain by doing life together, that we all in society gain by doing life together. Uh, and this idea of common good has, has come out already today, hasn't it? Anthony Albanese mentioned it towards the end uh, of his words this morning. So then you and I give up some of our natural freedom to just do whatever we like for the sake of finding a, a civic or a political freedom together uh, in society. Uh, and we, we honour this common good in the way that, that we live and interact with each other. So today I want to ask two questions. First of all, what actually do we want when we want a new social contract. What are we asking for, really? And secondly, what's the role of Christian social institutions in the renewal of the social contract? And in order to try and address those two questions, I want to make two points. Uh, that first of all, renewing the social contract is about the whole of society. And secondly, that renewing the social contract is about the whole person. It's about the whole of society and about the whole person. So then, first of all, renewing the social contract is about the whole of society. Social contract theory tends to focus on two elements of society. Uh, you've got the state on the one hand and the individual 
on the other hand, and it tends to cash social contracts out as, as an agreement between the state and the individual in one way or another. But of course, this misses out a huge part of society, doesn't it? What's been called civil society. Uh, those groups and bodies that are separate from the state and also often separate from the corporate sector. Um, you're thinking of sports clubs, schools, activist groups, and of course, Christian social institutions and churches as well. Uh, it's what Minister Stuart Robert earlier today called the, the hands and feet of society. And I think we might perhaps have some of the brains as well. In September last year, the British MP Danny Kruger uh, wrote a report for the Boris Johnson Conservative government entitled Leveling Up Our Communities, Proposals for a New Social Covenant. And in it, he sets out a vision for what he calls, quote, a more local, more human, less bureaucratic, less centralised society, quote, uh, in which there's space outside uh, of government control and outside of corporate control for common discussion uh, and common cooperation. You know, what he's asking for, I think, is uh, for a recognition of the importance of civil society in the way that we think about the social contract. Um, and it's important to do so because civil society has often been called, and I think quite helpfully, the missing middle in the way that we understand society. We, we tend to move, at least theoreticians tend to move, straight from the state level to the individual level, uh, missing out that the crucial civil society that mediates, necessarily mediates, between the state and the individual. And Christian social institutions, such as those that are represented in this room, play an incredibly important role in that missing middle. Uh, in 2019, a Pew survey uh, found that, quote, people who attend religious services, at least monthly, are more likely than people with no religious affiliation to join other types of non-religious organisations, such as uh, charities and clubs. Uh, also, that these people are more likely to vote than people with no religious affiliation. And also on an institutional level, uh, Christian organisations are, no need to tell an audience like this, a major presence in the NGO and charity sector. Um, the latest statistics I could find on this were, were from 2015, perhaps some of the audience will have my recent statistics, but in 2015, uh, a federal government commissioned report identified four of Australia's top five charities as Christian charities uh, and concluded that, and this is a quote from the report, uh, faith-based charities make an enormous and arguably underrecognised contribution to Australia's social infrastructure and social well-being. They are by far the largest single category of charity in Australia, with a third of all charities including, quote, advancements of religion as one of their charitable purposes, and with religion nominated as the main activity for a quarter of all charities, more than four times the size of the next largest category of activity. Close quote. Now, I do not say this so that Christians are members of any other religion, uh, can brag about it. Um, we are all aware uh, and we all grieve uh, over the harm uh, that Christians and Christian institutions uh, can sometimes cause in society. It can be, as we all know, horrific. Nevertheless, I do mention it so that Christians realise and maximise the amount of good that we can do in society. Uh, the contribution that we can make to this idea of the social good in this social contract that binds us all together. <coughs> because far from being, as Marx called it, the opium of the masses, lulling people to sleep in society, you know, Christianity is more like the adrenaline of the missing middle, galvanising, catalyzing civil society. And it's in this missing middle, isn't it? It's in this civil society that meaningful relationships are forged across boundaries, across generational boundaries, across ethnic boundaries, across ideological boundaries, uh, that wouldn't otherwise happen, people that wouldn't otherwise come together. Uh, and this is what makes civil society, if you like, the glue that holds our social contract together. Uh, in a word, in case anyone's not enough, 
It's about relationships. It's about relationships. Now, with a population of 25 million, it is impossible, isn't it, for everyone in this country to know the Prime Minister personally or to know the leader of the opposition personally. It's valuable that we're able to meet with them today because there's something important and irreplaceable about face-to-face -face embodied relationships. It's important to be in the same room, but, it, but it's unworkable for everybody in the country to be able to meet uh, with uh, uh, these people. But there's a cost to that, isn't there? Uh, because it's in concrete relationships that we find cultivated the, the values of trust and mutuality and engagement and ownership and loyalty that, that the social contract needs to keep society together. Um, it's not in the relationship between government and individual that that glue happens, it's in civil society. In his book, The New Social Contract, um, Liberal MP Tim Wilson argues that responsibility uh, isn't just about ownership, and those of you who read the book will know that he's very big on home ownership. He says responsibility isn't just about ownership, it's also about what he calls proximity. Now, we shouldn't just believe he argues uh, in small government, but in big citizens, echoing, of course, David Cameron's idea of the big society uh, from his prime ministership. Uh, the big society is a thriving civil society, uh, characterised, argues Wilson, by subsidiarity, decentralisation, accountability, and responsiveness. And uh, it's also a theme uh, that Anthony Albanese touched on this morning, and I wrote down his quote, an economy that puts human beings at its heart. So we've got this idea of the big citizen. Now, whether or not we agree with Wilson's liberalism, and I'm suspecting that there will be some people in this room who do and some people in this room who don't, I think this idea of, of the importance of civil society uh, is one that resonates across political persuasions. And Christian institutions and networks have one of the most developed and embedded sets of relationships in terms of what Wilson calls proximity and responsiveness. Uh, Danny Kruger, again, the British MP, writes, quote, faith communities have a greater asset than their wealth when it comes to providing support and succor to people in need. Their values, their concern for the spiritual well-being of individuals and society provide a motivation and a commitment that often exceeds that of paid professionals. They have deep roots in local communities, and they're there, he writes, for the long term. He continues, indeed, they often have big buildings at the heart of communities, including the poorest communities, and they operate both nationally and at the hyper-local level. Uh, these networks of a faith community, the relationships within a congregation or a faith group, are a source of huge resilience and opportunities for the people they seek to help. Close quote. As I was preparing for this talk, I, I, I tweeted out, hey, I'm going to go to Parliament, I'm going to speak about these things, what do people think that I should say? Uh, and uh, as a result of having read that tweet, a colleague came up to me at work uh, about a week after, uh, and she said that she'd been really struck by the way that churches, uh, people predominantly from an Indonesian background, uh, had been responding to the COVID crisis, providing food for people, providing company for people, uh, in a way that, that, that either of the groups weren't aware of or, or weren't able to provide, uh, and that they'd been on the ground in that community, helping out during the lockdown uh, in Melbourne. Um, and, and this was a note, wasn't it, also struck by the International Development Minister earlier today, that the, the boots on the ground nature of, of the local networks uh, of Christian organisations. If civil society is missing from our attempts to rewrite the social contract, uh, then what I fear we end up with is a vision that relies exclusively on laws and regulations as the levers that can change society. Uh, and that frankly is gutted of the trust, uh, mutuality, engagement, and responsibility that, that characterize relationships in civil society. So that was my first point. Uh, rewriting the social contract is about the whole of society, specifically including civil society. But there's another important consideration in relation to the social contract. 
Uh, and it's that rewriting the social contract is about the whole person as well. One dominant understanding of the social contract tries to, to keep religious conviction outside the public debate when it comes to deciding what our common good is. The highly influential philosopher John Rawls, who single-handedly uh, revived social contract theory uh, in the 20th century, um, uh, has this idea uh, that the common good must be built on uh, ideas that exclude what he calls the comprehensive doctrines. Religious faith would be one of those. Uh, these, these substantive visions of the social good. If you have those in the conversation, you can never arrive at the idea of a common good, as far as Rawls is concerned. <coughs> It's, it, it's a view of society in which religious conviction is like the kernel that you can thresh away in order to reveal the, the, the pure edible husk of secular reason inside of it. Let's call this the Rawlsian reduction, uh, reducing complex, comprehensive doctrines to, to one single mode of expression, uh, secular reason. Uh, I think it's got at least two major problems. First of all, it doesn't let religious groups, or indeed it doesn't let any group that's got a settled vision of the good life, be authentic in public. Uh, they have to pretend that the reasons for their convictions are not what they are. Uh, they've got to pretend that they didn't come from their view of the world. Uh, if you like, they've got to pretend that their plants grew without any soil. Uh, leaving religious convictions at the door is like unmaking a cake to try and extract the flour from it. it it's not only impossible, but it, it ruins the cake as well. And this actually strangles much of the work that Christian institutions can do for the common good. Because serving people is not just about putting bread in their hands. It's also, isn't it, about kindling hope in their hearts. And the second problem uh, with the Rawlsian reduction uh, is that it allows one position, one comprehensive doctrine, to use Rawls' own language, to act as if it isn't one. As many commentators have shown, shown Rawls doesn't actually realise that he's got himself one of these comprehensive doctrines. Uh, and the principles that he thinks are, are universal and accessible to everyone, such as fairness and making sure that no one is too disadvantaged, are just as much a vision of the good as, as the positions he'd seek to exclude. It's as if one player in the AFL match has snatched the, the referee's whistle and has started calling fouls on the players it doesn't like. It, it, it's not a good basis uh, to, to create a strong social contract. So then, contrary to roles, uh, what, what I and, and many others argue, uh, is that renewing the social contract should address the whole person including their comprehensive doctrines, uh, not just those parts of the person that can be squeezed into the mould of public secular reason. And perhaps a, a more holistic way for, for Christians to think about this, rather than uh, talking about the, the public square as a place of secular reason, is to use the motif of good neighbourliness, being good neighbours in society. I think this motif has got a lot going for it. Uh, because a, a good neighbour is not above everyone else uh, in society, acting like some patrician benefactor, uh, giving but never receiving. Uh, but nor is a good neighbour below everyone else in society, locked out of the conversation and reduced to shouting through the keyhole. And of course, Christian neighbourliness uh, is also about loving those who society would otherwise not but who society would otherwise ostracise or shun. Uh, it's, it's the powerful parable, isn't it? The subversive and settling parable of the Good Samaritan uh, that uh, Shay Neumann uh, mentioned this morning. Uh, and Jesus is confronting command to love who? To love our enemies. So good neighbourliness then takes account of the whole person uh, and its contribution to renewing and strengthening the social contract can be summed up in a term from the, the, the Yale theologian Miroslav Volk. He talks about sharing wisdom in society. And a part of sharing wisdom is sharing the distinctively Christian perspective on life. Uh, what Rawls would call the Christian comprehensive doctrine, 
uh, and what we might be more inclined to call a Christian worldview or a Christian perspective. And it's this overarching framework of creation and fall, redemption and consummation uh, through which a Christian experiences and lives the whole of her life and the whole of reality. And done sensitively, uh, done with a listening ear, uh, this sharing can greatly serve the common good. It is widely acknowledged, isn't it, today that we are uh, facing a, a mental health crisis, it's been called, or epidemic. Now, of course, the, the, complexes of, of, um, the causes of such a thing are, are always complex and uh, multifaceted. Uh, but one aspect of this that researchers have identified uh, is a feeling of purposelessness or meaninglessness, a growing feeling uh, of purposelessness among people, linked often to a, a lack of belonging or feelings of isolation and loneliness. Uh, one 2019 Yale University study concluded that, quote, in-depth interviews with individuals who have screened positive for depression indicated that their experiences were connected intimately uh, to a declining sense of purpose, close quote. Now, uh, I won't stand up here and be so glib as to suggest that Christianity is, a, is an easy fix for this. And yet, this does resonate with what in a philosophical register, the, the philosopher Charles Taylor would call life in the imminent frame, uh, where there's nothing beyond our immediate experience of the world, there's no greater meaning to, to, to be gathered up into. Uh, in the imminent frame, people can suffer from an absence of what Taylor calls fullness uh, in his book, The Secular Age. Uh, fullness is the idea of being taken outside of ourselves into some larger purpose, an experience of life and the world as imbued with meaning and beauty and connection. Uh, and it, it's that desire that's preyed upon uh, in the radicalization that we were hearing about this morning. And this fullness is, is what the Christian view of the world offers. But, triple underline this next bit, important point. But, it's also what the Christian view of the world subverts and transforms. Not simply offering a therapeutic intervention, but, but changing people from the inside uh, into a new paradigm of other focused experience. As, as author Timothy Keller says uh, in his book, Making Sense of God, uh, Christi Christianity offers, quote, a meaning that suffering can't take from you, a satisfaction uh, that is not based on circumstances, an identity that doesn't crush you or exclude others, a hope that can face anything, and a justice uh, that does not create a new oppressors, close quote. And, and those are things, are they not, that strengthen the common good, that promote flourishing, and that flow directly from what we're also called the Christian comprehensive doctrine. So again, in the words of uh, Miroslav Vol, quote, a vision of human flourishing and the resources to realize it is the most important contribution of the Christian faith to the common good, close quote. Now, another aspect of good neighbourliness is, of course, sharing practical wisdom that flows from this particular view of the world. And, and wisdom here has a very broad meaning, as broad as it does in, in the book of Proverbs in the Bible. Uh, everything from the, the, the fear of the Lord being the beginning of wisdom, uh, to practical advice about how to run a household, how to manage finances, how to, to run a business. And where does the creation for redemption story of, of the Christian perspective on life is, is really unique to Christianity in, in, in the form that the Bible presents it. it, it it's in this level of wisdom, the sort of stuff that you find in the book of Proverbs, that there's much more overlap between the Christian tradition uh, and other traditions in our society. And indeed, some of the book of Proverbs, scholars think, uh, is taken from, from ancient Egyptian wisdom literature. And as historian Tom Holland uh, has, has recently uh, very persuasively argued in his book, Dominion, this, this sort of wisdom coming out of the Christian tradition has had a profound effect on societies that have been influenced by that tradition for the common good. Uh, it's played an important role in the development of human rights, he and others argue. 
uh, in the idea of leadership as service. I was struck this morning when you by Tanya Pribasek's uh, uh, quote uh, that in politics you've got to make the choice, she said. Uh, is it an invitation to power or is it an invitation to service? Um, we've been much less likely to ask that question uh, were our society not influenced by the Bible. Uh, it's given us an ethic of humility as opposed to a Roman ethic of glory. Uh, another thing that came up this morning in question time, the importance of humility in politics. It's given us the compassionate treatment of the weakest among us, the widows and orphans, by no means a universal cultural value. Uh, it's given us the very idea of the common good. Uh, it's given us, Miroslav Wolf argues, political pluralism. Uh, and of course, uh, Christians helped uh, in the abolition of slavery as well. And the reason that these things are now part of the fabric of our society it, it, is that Christians in the Roman Empire didn't take a Rawlsian approach. Uh, they didn't simply seek to serve the vision of the good that was current in the Roman Empire. Uh, but as they were able, they challenged that vision of the good. And eventually, by God's grace, they subverted that vision of the good uh, in order to create what almost everyone today would say is a better society than ancient Roman society. And so when individual Christians and Christian institutions share wisdom to help meet the practical needs of society, it isn't in a way divorced from our worldview. Uh, Graham Tomlin, who's the Bishop of Kensington in London, the Anglican Bishop of Kensington, uh, puts it in this way. He says, quote, the church's civic engagement is not a simple extension of social services. Uh, the role of the church is not to fill the gaps left by the welfare state. Now, this is why the identification of the church's social and political engagement is primarily an act of witness is so important. Uh, we set up food banks, offer debt advice, give homes to the homeless, care for creation and, and combat childhood poverty, not simply because our society needs a bit of help or because government can't do it on their own. We do these things, he says, because in the name of Christ, as acts of witness to the God of compassion, mercy and justice. Uh, these are, he says, in the language of the Gospel of John, signs that point to another reality. Uh, their significance isn't found in themselves or in their political meaning, but in their capacity to point to the kingdom of God that is one day coming, and to the God whose kingdom that is. Close quote. Now, people sometimes have the view, don't they, that the, the good that Christian institutions do in society, the, the good neighbourliness that, that we offer to people, it, it is all in meeting people's material needs, improving their material lives. But to think that way, I think, falls back into this Rawlsian reduction. Because sharing worldview and sharing wisdom sit alongside practical measures uh, in serving the common good. Uh, and those measures, while they are extremely valuable in themselves, are also signs that point to a fullness that itself promotes the common good. So as I begin to wrap up now, I want to leave you guys with two takeaways from what I've uh, been sharing today. First of all, Christian institutions have an important role to play in renewing the social contract that includes the whole of society, uh, not neglecting the missing middle uh, where relationships are made and where trust, mutuality and engagement are fostered. Uh, and secondly, the Christian institutions have an important role to play in the renewal of the social contract that takes account of the whole person, uh, being good neighbours by sharing both worldview and wisdom with those around us. And so I'd like to finish uh, by quoting an account from uh, a meeting of faith-based leaders uh, that gathered in the aftermath of the shooting in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014 uh, of Michael Brown, uh, who, as many of us will know, was an 18-year-old black man shot by a 28 year old white police officer. Uh, the account is written by Michael Ray Matthews uh, from a group called the, the PICO Collective, uh, People Involved in Community Organising, and he writes, As I continued to lead songs and chants in the pouring rain, uh, one of the seminarians grabbed the bullhorn and asked if we should change our chants from 
show me what democracy looks like, to show me what theology looks like. And she was calling her sisters and brothers in the faith to go all in, in the richness of our faith, into the public space. Close quote. So then, what is the role of the Christian social institution in helping renew the social contract? Uh, well, I'm sure there's a great deal of wisdom in this room, uh, oceans of wisdom uh, on that question. Uh, but, but if I can just try and add one drop uh, to the ocean, it is to be a good neighbour, uh, to foster the common good by sharing wisdom uh, so that we can humbly show our society uh, what theology looks like. Thanks so much, Chris. I was not expecting this uh, clarion call for really substantive Christian thought to wholeheartedly contribute to the, the conversation about the, the social contract. That's, that's uh, really heartening. Um, I want to open the questioning with something a little bit maybe left field. Um, in 1994, there were two Canadian um, political philosophers, Goldstein and Rayner, who said that uh, identity politics um, and I guess we'd say nowadays also the rise in something called intersectionality, um, aren't really conducive to working out common interests together because these are movements that are typified by folks really feeling the need to put out in public um, you know, feelings really about themselves that are specific to them and that this can fragment uh, the polity. Uh, so I'm just wondering nowadays what you might suggest to us, given that uh, the social context of the whole person, if for those who believe that the whole person thing is all about somehow, we're never quite sure how recognising their identity, um, can these kind of go together? How can Christian organisations uh, work with that while also working in a sense beyond that and above that? Um, does that make sense? So, yeah, completely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, let, let me sketch out a, a schema for doing that and then answer the specific example that you uh, raised. I, I found um, 1 Corinthians 1 an, an incredible help in thinking through questions like this. Um, so uh, Paul is, is speaking about the, the dominant cultures of his age, the, the, the Jews uh, and the, the, the Greeks or the Gentiles. Uh, and he picks out uh, an important value in each of their cultures. He said Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. Uh, and later on, he's equating in the passage signs with, with power, demonstrations of God's power. Um, and he acknowledges that there is something important about seeking those things. He doesn't say, um, uh, how stupid, let's, not, let's forget about signs, let's forget about wisdom. He doesn't do that. But neither does he accept them in the terms in which those people are looking for. And what he does is something incredibly subversive, incredibly radical. He challenges the Jews and the Greeks, to find the ultimate fulfillment of what they're looking for in the place they would least think of looking for it. He <laughs> says to the Greeks, if you want to see real wisdom, look at the foolishness of a man hanging on the cross. Uh, and Jews, if you want to see power, look at the helplessness of a man uh, hanging on the cross. Because, he says, he's real power. Um, if you're willing to go there, and if you're willing to try and find these things there, you will find the wisdom of God and the power of God, the ultimate fulfilment of those things that you're looking for. And so, so what he's doing, and one of my friends, um, Dan Strange, has called this a subversive fulfilment, and it's a really helpful phrase, of these values. He neither dismisses them, nor does he accept them wholesale. But he says, let's, let's take what it is in what you're looking for that's good, and it is good, but let's completely transform it. And if you're willing to go with me, let's look in the place that you'd least expect to find. Um, and so to, to try and bring that sort of logic of subversive fulfillment uh, to, to the question that you raised, um, in terms of identity politics, intersectionality, and so forth, um, it is a scandal, isn't it, uh, that after I don't know, 100 years of Hollywood, uh, we can count the number of films released uh, by, directed by black women uh, on, on the fingers of, of two hands. Um, because people who 
they would occupy a different position in life, have a different experience of life. To, to, to be a black woman, to take that example, uh, is not the same as, as to be a white man, as I am. Uh, and, and so there's, there's something in this discourse that I think that is incredibly important and that really resonates with a, a, a biblical view of the world. If you think of, Res of Revelation 7, all the tribes, tongues, and nations gathered around the throne, uh, not denuded of their particularity, but each, each worshiping God. So, so there's something about everybody being heard that, that, that is right and important to them. Uh, and so I, I think we would want to, to, to affirm um, a lot of what that discourse is saying. And, and of course, it it's, becomes problematic when it begins to create fractures uh, and, and groupings in society that are, that are judged on the basis of their group, either to be goodies or baddies and so on. And, and, and some of it certainly does that. But, but I think what I want to do is lead, lead that discourse through a one Corinthians one type dynamic. Uh, and, and to try and think through, and it takes time and it takes listening and it, it's not easy to do, but to work out what um, Dan Strange will call the subversive fulfillment of that design. Thank you. Thanks very much. I thought that was fascinating, your, um, your lecture. Um, and I heard in the introduction that you've written a book about atheism. So I'm imagining that you're familiar with a book called um, uh, Religion for Atheists by Alan Bottom. And in which, for those who are not familiar with it, um, the philosopher draws out a number of components of world faith which are generally good, they're just a good thing to do, irrespective of, of, of where they come from. Um, when we think about that in relation to the common good and this requirement, as you describe it, to be able to simultaneously acquire and concede uh, some power or capability or aspect of your self in order to, for the common good to be achieved. Um, do you think it's possible to create an opportunity to do that and for people to embrace, um, if you like, precepts of faith without feeling that they are being um, drawn into that faith. So they're able to do something which is for the common good, which may have a Christian principle or an Islamic principle or a Judaic principle without actually feeling they've been co-opted into that. And I, I wonder if that's something which stops people embracing some opportunities that are placed place before them. It's important for that. Really, really interesting um, question. Thank you. Look, I the question makes me think of, of Augustine's City of God, and, and he's got a, a, a really powerful way, I think, of, of navigating this question. Um, and he um, notes at one point that Christians uh, like the restraint of vice in society. They have particular reasons for wanting that. And that Roman society also likes vice to be restrained for very different reasons. So they've got a different idea of the ultimate good, but they both want people not to be vicious in society. Uh, and he says, great, uh, well, that's, that's positive. We don't, we're not agreed on why, but we at least agreed on the means to our different ends. Uh, and I think that's the way in which I frame it. So too often, the, the, the idea is to try and get people with different comprehensive doctrines to agree on the ends. Uh, and I think all you arrive at that way is either a porridge that nobody particularly enjoys and doesn't reflect what anybody really thinks, or you end up with the sort of Rawlsian situation of one of the players on the pitch becoming the referee and deciding what's okay for all the others, um, which, which isn't great for the social contract. Um, but it, it's in this, this, this middle level, if you like. Um, so if you think of a, a three stories between very practical, what I do when I get out of bed in the morning on the, on the ground level, a sort of a, a level, a medium level of values, uh, whether I think vice is a good thing or a bad thing, whether it's good to be honest or bad to be honest, that sort of thing. And then the, the, the top level that, that contains all of that is, is the worldview and creation for redemption. It's in that middle level that I think there's a lot of consensus. Um, and, uh, you know, the book of Proverbs, uh, again, is a great example of that. Uh, there's, there's lots in that book that, that people who are not from a, a Jewish or Christian background would say, yeah, that's common sense, that, that's good, that makes sense. Uh, now, we would happen to come at those things from a Christian worldview. Uh, other people would come at those things from a different worldview. But there, there's consensus in that middle level without having to pretend that our worldviews, that our comprehensive doctrines are the same. 
I think I just want to push back a little bit on the Alan de Botton point that um, it's, it's very easy sitting um, in a, a nice middle class lounge uh, in England uh, to, to look out at the world. And this is not directed to de Botton in particular, this is a general um, uh, thing that, 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 that I think we need to be aware of just as much as he does. Um, to look and see that there are components of the good out there, there are lots of different uh, views of the world. Um, but when you drill down to it, 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 it's not quite as clear as that, I think. John Frame, the, the theologian, makes a very helpful point uh, in his one of his big books, um, he's got a lot of big books, that um, even the idea that life is better than death, which we would sort of think of as, well, obviously, is not universal. Uh, the idea of being released to be back with the one um, is, is, is a prominent idea in, uh, historically and geographically now. And so no doubt there is common ground, but I, I don't think it's quite as big as, as some people, the bottom being one example, there are many more, would often suggest that that's the case. Uh, Chris, thanks. Um, great presentation. My name's Mark Fowler. Just, um, I'm a lawyer in practice, so I just wanted to take a practical application uh, of some of the, the principles you put for, forward. So there is an ongoing issue in Australian law around faith-based providers and whether they are exempt in anti-discrimination law. And so you're uh, putting before us today the, the Augustinian clash of competing loves within the public domain. <coughs> Back at the engine room of, of the organisations that are here today, their ability to articulate a view is really contingent upon their ability to maintain an ethos within their own organisation. So there's a much celebrated case a few years ago where St Vincent de Paul's was found to not be able to require a president of a local conference to be a Catholic. And key to that was the genuine occupational requirements test, which is um, mushroomy in Australian law at the moment. So at the practical level, the ability for a Christian view, and indeed a Christian view that is minded towards benevolent needs within our community, as is garnered through this group of people, their ability to maintain that view is contingent upon their ability to access exemptions in anti-discrimination law. I just wonder if you've considered that practical application, um, you know, in your desire to seek this open contest of loves in the public domain. Thank you so much. For that question. Uh, there is precedent, is there not, uh, from this podium this morning uh, to say there are other people who are better equipped to answer that question than I am. Um, so I, I, I take courage from not being the first person to answer to, to that. Um, I, I, I am not a lawyer. Uh, I, I do not understand law very well at all. Uh, if my wife were here, she would be able uh, to, to tackle your question, I'm sure, but uh, I I'm not able to stand in her shoes, and I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I just don't know. Hi, Chris. Uh, Nick from Cinnamon Network. I love the presentation. Thank you for taking us to a, a different level of thought um, than perhaps we might otherwise have got to. I wanted to make a suggestion and get your feedback on it. In, in the vein of exploring, and I think it's come up in some other presentations as well, ways in which we as Christian organisations, as churches, as Christian leaders can better engage in the public square and the public realm and foster robust discussion of issues on which we might disagree. Is there that a struggle, like I think, for a lot of us is how do you how do we enter into that space? How do we help have those conversations? And how do we change some of the tone or the perception uh, of Christians and of the church as being the ones who, uh, whether accurate or not, rightly or wrongly, are often coming with a rejection of uh, or a definition of what we're not, what we're against? Is there a way in which this kind of um, I think it was this this subversive uh, acceptance or this subversive, subversive theology you were talking about, where we might be able to instead look at our adversaries, and that might be within the church as opposed to uh, as well as outside, and find the common that common realm of values uh, on which we can accept and meet people 
but then take them and take the conversation to a deeper or a higher level of discussion which reflects our broader Christian worldview uh, that could affirm the things that we share as well as then, I guess, humbly yet also confidently articulating the ways in which and the reasons for which we might hold a different pers uh, perspective. Do you think that there's value in that type of approach and, and have you seen it being done uh, successfully, that or other ways of being able to, to engage? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, look, thank you, Nick, again, really, really great question. How do you enter into uh, that place of being able to, uh, to give and take? Um, sort of on a theoretical level, uh, and then I'll try and come to some practical stuff afterwards. Um, I, I think it, it begins by, in, in a sense, doing the basics of Christian ethics, as, you know, as, as I'm sure you would say yourself, you know, loving one's neighbour, one by one, whoever happens to be uh, in front of me. Uh, and again, it's, it, it's about relationships. I guess all, all that I'm saying today is really, it's about relationships. There, there was that context of trust and mutuality where people can begin to, to just be a little bit vulnerable, can begin to probe, knowing that there's a relational context that, that makes that okay to do. I, I forget which minister it was this morning that was saying, we can't do things from 10,000 feet in the air. Um, and, and I think this is one of those cases where you can't, there's no sort of advertising campaign or media blitz that, that, that can do this because it, it's carried this sort of, reality is carried in relationships and in, in, in terms of people you know, well, you know, how often have we heard, oh, I don't like Christians. Oh, not you, but Christians in general. And it, it's that dynamic, isn't it? It's, and and the, the reality is that fewer and fewer people in our society know an open Christian, someone who they know to be Christian personally. And that's a problem. Uh, because if you don't know anyone personally, then you're like, more likely to be trading in the sort of stereotypes that are, that are peddled often. And so um, I think whatever the answer is, my sort of contribution would be that it will have to come in those personal relationships, those embodied one-to-one -one or one-to-two or, or, or three uh, relationships where people know Christians and feel able to open up and, and, and to make themselves a little bit vulnerable and say, hey, I just believe that crazy stuff, um, in a way that, that, that if you're just facing some sort of impersonal campaign, you can never raise those sort of questions. Um, thanks for that, it's been great. Um, but I, I do want to ask a question about maybe a complementary approach, and it's based about audience. So um, Paul is speaking to Christians in Corinth, um, admittedly about what the Jewish and Gentile perspective is. When he does it in Athens, I think that's more like our situation where he wanders the streets, spends a lot of time of walking and observing what they worship, and he's, and he's angry. But he doesn't actually express the anger. But um, he, he rejects the idolatry, but then he, he starts with common things, starts with creation, and, and quotes their poets, etc., etc. Um, so he connects um, before he corrects and subverts. Um, now he's in the city, he, he walks the streets like Socrates. And so it, it's actually, it's not a, not a, just a very gradual kind of, you know, working from things that we've got in common. He, he does actually subvert them. And it's like our situation where the law is now threatening because the court of Areopagus is not just a bunch of philosophers, it's a court. And he's likely to be tried on a capital charge like Socrates as to whether he misleads the youth, of which we are increasingly charged with misleading youth in schools, etc., and and uh, introducing new gods, and even when he then he and he's very minimal in what he says about Jesus. For instance, when he subverts somebody, he, he just says a man um, called Jesus, who God's appointed to judge you, and and he leaves it at that. And then what he um, some of them some of them laughed, and they think he's talking about a marriage between the. Uh, because the, the, the term in, in terms of resurrection is kind of um, can be used sort of um, you know feminist feminine language etc. So they they think maybe that's what he's what he's talking about. But um, he just goes for the second hearing, 
And I think our problem is we do not work like Paul and, and try and establish grounds for a second hearing. And some of them, including one of the, one of the court judges, wants the hearing and a bunch of women. Um, it's usually the women who get it first. They've got the resurrection first and they usually get, get it first. Um, and, and I think that's a, that's a slightly different strategy about how we gradually thicken up our language. So we might start with values, but values can have a very consumerist, relativist kind of thing behind it. Or you can talk about virtue in very thick language, but people are not going to necessarily get that. Whereas something like character is mediating language, works of individuals and of um, communities or organisations, a character and culture of an organisation, etc., etc. A culture of Parliament House that has three alleged rapes by one man, a, a serial rapist. Um, how we raise those questions. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing against what you're saying, but I'm saying there are different audiences and for a complementary kind of approach. So I'm mm -hmm. interested in what you. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, go on. Yeah, no, I'm really glad you used the word complementary because I think that's the way that I see it as well. I don't think Paul is doing something fundamentally different in, in one thing he's one to what he's doing at 17. Um, uh, his audience is, is different, you're right, he's, he's, he's writing to the church in Wonkin, he's writing that 17. Luke is relating what, what he said uh, to a gathering uh, of uh, uh, Greeks. Um, and I think, I think what, what I would pick out of both of those passages is, is a, a, a four-step process that, that I think is there in, in its completion in 1 Corinthians 1, but then he gets cut off, doesn't he, in Acts 17, when he mentions the resurrection. Uh, people, people shouting down to it, but never really gets to the end. And, and, and it's the, it's the, the stages of number one. And I'm getting this from from Tim Keller. This is not me. Um, he says that the first stage is to, to identify quite rightly, as you said, through walking the streets, through carefully observing the culture, something that is precious to the culture. You know what they want. Um, uh, and you know you've, you've got idols, who are obviously very religious. Uh, and then in one Corinthians one, you, you really love signs, don't you? You guys really go for wisdom. Um, and then he, he, he just teases it apart a little bit. Um, he begins to, to pull at the threads of that value in the way that it's understood in the culture. So in 1 Corinthians 1, um, uh, there's, there's the sense that you, you can't reach the fullness of, of those values in the way that you're searching for them at the moment. And then in, in Acts 17, it's, you, you, know, you don't even know your gods, do you? you know, you've got this unknown God, what's that doing? You know, he's you, you claimed to worship the gods. You know, and it's very similar to what Augustine's doing in the first half of the City of God as well. If you believe A, why don't you believe B? And if you believe A and B, you can't have both, which you've got to choose. It's that, that sort of dynamic. Uh, and, and then he moves on to say, this is how to find the deepest fulfillment of what you're searching for in, in Christ. You know, let me explain this God to you, this, this, this God that you don't even know. Um, uh, he, he made us all. Uh, as your poets have said, you know, he, he keeps tying it into the, to the culture and then finally, you know, gets to, uh, to the resurrection, which is the point at which they, they throw up their hands and uh, uh, dismiss him. Uh, and then in, in 1 Corinthians 1 as well, uh, this is how you can find true wisdom in Christ. This is how you can find true power in Christ. And so I think there's, there's a parallel working through there, e even though the audiences are, uh, are different. Hello, um, my question this afternoon, and thank you very much for your presentation. My question is a little bit different, and it goes to the issue of where environmental considerations might come into redefining a social contract. And thinking about that in terms of um, the impact of the bushfires, the, the sense of devastation the um, diminished environment of housing estates, the lack of public spaces. Um, these are all important parts of thinking, again, about um, that link somewhere between the individual and, and government. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested in where you think that might fit. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, huge and very important question. The, the French philosopher, um, that hardly anyone's heard of, on, on whom I've just written a book, asks this very question. Uh, and he says one of the problems, and he's not the only one to say this, with our social contract is it, that it assumes that the only things that exist and that matter are human beings and human communities. 
and that you can completely disregard Amelia. And he has this wonderful image where there's this Goya painting of two uh, men fighting each other, bashing each other with cudgels, and they're gradually sinking into quicksand, uh, soon to be submerged. And he said, that's us. We, we completely discount the, the environment to our peril. Um, we were so busy fighting each other and working down the money each other. That we, that we think. And so, long story short, he wrote a book called The Natural Contract, where he tries to take the principle of the social contract and expand it to say, what would it look like if we made a contract with the environment? Now, that sounds weird, but then he tries to sort of say, well, hold on, this social contract that we're all so keen on, who signed it? Where was it signed? Nowhere. It's, it's just a, a motif that we use to make sense of the social settlement that we have. Well, in that case, why not a natural contract to make sense of the relationship that we already have with the natural environment? Because after all, it puts exigencies on us. I, I can't float upwards, I must go downwards. There are certain laws that, that we are subject to uh, in terms of the environment. So he, he teases it out in that way. And I, I, I think from a, a Christian point of view, um, there's a... Um, even though in the Genesis account that there's certainly something very distinct and special and unique about human beings, um, you know, Adam is the only one into whom God, God breathes, God, God speaks everything else into being, yeah, God breathes the spirit into man, which is a very interesting choice of words and made in the image of God. It, but it, it's not an anthropocentrism to the exclusion of the environment. There's always an embeddedness. Your man is made on the same day as the animals. That, that there's a, a, a very strong sense that we are part of this network of creation as well as, as occupying a special place in it. And so I think if you want to just translate that natural contract language into a more um, Christian idiom, then, then going through that creation story would, would allow you to cut across a dichotomy. That, that we're often presented with, and I think a, a lot of environmental discourse tends to fall into. Um, it's a really unhelpful dichotomy between, on one hand, the one option that we're given is that we're there to exploit the natural world for profit, because that's what matters, and technology will figure out a way to get us out of the mess we've got ourselves in. We need to back ourselves. And the other view is that we almost need to worship the environment, that we need to act as if we weren't here, to, to, to leave it alone uh, and to, to try and, and, and almost venerate it in the state that it is at the moment, which I think is problematic because it's always changing and because it's always changing anyway. And they, they, the, the Bible diagonalizes all of them, which is cumbersome philosophical term, or more, more sort of straightforwardly cuts across those two options. It's that there's neither of those. You know, we, we, we respect the environment, not because the environment itself is, is, is an object to worship, but because the God who created both us and it but wants us to take care of it and not ruin it. Um, and so I think that there's a, a distinctive Christian angle to bring on a lot of, of these debates that, that resolves to neither of, of those really unhelpful dichotomous choices. Well, we're out of time. I know there's already several other questions that I think we might be pursued about afterwards. Uh, thank you for helping us to see that we're, we're in a unique position uh, to be thought leaders, actually, in this national discussion <laughs> around the social contract. But I find it really interesting that uh, we're one of the very few polities in this uh, on this planet called a common a common good, a common wealth, um, and uh, under God, he's hoping that that's. Um, uh, that'll mean that there's a, a, a kind of a friendly uh, environment in our DNA for this Christian wisdom to land. It's given me hope today. And we want to give you this uh, lovely illustrated Bible from uh, the Bible Society with beautiful indigenous art in it. Uh, so please show your appreciation. Thank you. Thank you.